Ms. Cordes. While there are no Q&A sessions for presenters of asynchronous panels, we encourage all attendees to interact with the presentation in the comment section of the student's presentation on the conference website. Visit athenacommons.muw.edu slash urc slash 2023 and navigate to the Social Sciences One panel. Feel free to ask questions and post encouraging comments as you listen. Our first panel this afternoon in Students in Psychology and Family Sciences our first presenter will be Tara Dora, and the title of their presentation is Perceived Racism and Help Seeking Behaviors on College Campuses. Our second and final presenter is Annie Hollis, whose presentation is titled Antagonistic Pliotropy and Alzheimer's Disease. Hello, my name is Tara Dora, and my assignment is on perceived racism and hip seeking. Perceived racism study background. Counseling services are on many college campuses, but students do not always use them. Students may have issues like depression, anxiety, or other conflicts, and they still refuse to get help. Researchers have studied possible reasons that this occurs. Students at PWIs and HBCUs have different levels of openness to help seeking behaviors due to perceived racism. Six universities in Mississippi will participate in this study. Students will participate in an assessment on perceived racism, help seeking attitudes, and the intent to seek help among students. The whole purpose of the study is to examine how perceived racism on college campuses impact mental health and help-seeking behavior. Face-to-face -face and online courses will be measured. The findings will help propose better solutions to get students to open up and receiving help. After reviewing the results of these studies, counselors and students will be able to respond to this in a way that may impact mental health in the future. So hopefully after doing this study, we'll find better ways to keep Black students and white students to receive more help. Perceived racism study research questions. How has perceived racism influenced students to get help? How often do students experience perceived racism? What barriers stop African American students from going to counseling centers? My hypothesis. I hypothesize that. Some students may report that perceived racism has hindered them from seeking help. African-American students may be less likely to perceive help at PWIs. This may be, be because the level of perceived racism, stigmas, and barriers. Although I do believe that perceived racism could be a problem when African-Americans want to receive help but refuse to do it. But I do also believe that stigmas and barriers also play a role in these because it's more than just perceived racism. There are also other reasons that African-Americans choose not to get help. Participants. In this study, participants will be students from six different universities. They are Mississippi University for Women, the University of Mississippi, Mississippi State University, Jackson State University, Delta State University, as well as Alcorn University. Materials and methods. Well, since this assignment will, this, this study will be online, basically they only need any type of cellular device to access their emails. This could be a cell phone, iPad, tablet, laptop, desktop. So for the materials, we only needed cellular devices to access the surveys and their emails. Each school report their data after the students have completed them. Since the data is only on a college campus or students from a college campus, it can be concluded that recorded responses will range from 18 to 25. The primary data will be collected from all students who participate in completing it. Since the data will be since the, the data will be represented in a qualitative manner. Perceived racism, predicted results. The predicted results are that 
perceived racism is lower at historically black colleges and universities. Help seeking is higher at PWIs and more racially diverse institutions. Perceived racism may be lower at HBCUs due to the ratio between black and white Americans. Help seeking may be higher at PWIs due to the ratio between white and black Americans as well. We're saying this because Black students may feel more comfortable receiving help at an HBCU because it's a historically Black college, so more African-American people will be there. On the other hand, when you have PWIs, Black students may feel more comfortable because there are usually more White people there. Although it is just not limited to these things, stigmas and barriers still do exist, and this is reflected in help-seeking behaviors. Discussion. Overall, this study will yield another investigation as to why the results are the way they, they are. Things that could be considered are things like cultural norms and stigmas and microaggressions. All of these things could be replaced with something more positive, yielding in a positive outcome. To start off, cultural norms. Some people may think. Well, some African Americans may think that receiving help is not helpful, it's too white, or it's weak. All of these are possible reasons that African Americans refuse to seek help because they're stereotypically thinking. Everyone should be educated on the reasons why or the benefits of help seeking. It doesn't make you weak. You do not have to be a certain race to receive help. And it's it shouldn't be considered. It shouldn't be considered as not helpful due to the fact that it's therapy. It's supposed to help you. So I feel as if African Americans were more educated and more knowledgeable on benefits of help seeking, then maybe they'll be more open to do so. It is not limited to perceived racism. It is also stereotypes that exist in our community. Secondly, microaggressions. I do believe that microaggressions play a big part in this. Microaggressions may be the reason that some students do not seek help. The way we present ourselves in conversations is important. A simple eye roll or degrading look may stop a student from seeking help. It may seem uncomfortable. And when you're less, you're, you're less likely to seek help from someone when you're not comfortable with them. We can replace these microaggressions with microaffirmations. So for example, if I was walking down the hallway and I seen a professor and the professor just looks at me instead of speaking, I mean, I would feel some type of way because I feel like as professors, you should be open and make the students feel comfortable with you. But just staring and looking at me, I might take that as, okay, maybe she's having a bad day. Maybe she just don't want to speak. And I feel like these things are what lead to microaggressions. So I feel as something as simple as that can make you change your mind on receiving help. If I walk by and that same professor was like, hey, how are you? Are you having a good day? I think I'll be more open to listening and seeing what the professor has to say. Limitations. Some limitations include that this research, this research is only done on colleges in the South. So I feel like if we compare these results to students up North, it could be different. That's it. I hope you enjoyed my study.
Hello, my name is Annie Hollis and I am a senior here at Mississippi University for Women and today I'm going to be talking about antagonistic pleiotropy in Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is progressive and neurodegenerative in nature, characterized by a buildup of amyloid plaques and tau neurofibrillary tangles within the brain and its neurons. In this figure here, you can see the shape of a typical human brain compared to what a brain looks like in individuals with Alzheimer's disease. Because of the disease's neurodegeneration, there is large neuronal loss that can be seen, which is evident through brain scans and autopsies. Right now in our country, over 6 million people are living with Alzheimer's disease. When this is grouped with the other dementias, just in 2023, Alzheimer's disease will contribute costs to the nation of over $345 billion. There are over 11 million people in the U.S. providing unpaid care for individuals with Alzheimer's disease. These individuals would be family and friends of those who are diagnosed with AD. The risk of having AD at 45 years of age is 1 in 5 for women and 1 in 10 for men. So what is antagonistic pleiotropy and how might this relate to Alzheimer's disease? The word pleiotropy means that one specific gene is coding for multiple phenotypes. A phenotype is the expression of an individual's DNA genotype, like hair color or eye color. An example of pleiotropy would be how an albinism, the same gene that codes for skin color, also codes for immune system health. With antagonistic pleiotropy, however, the phenotypes that a gene codes for are in opposition and are working against one another. In fruit flies, the gene that causes them to reproduce earlier in life also causes them to have shorter lifespans. So even though they are getting to reproduce earlier, they aren't getting to reproduce as long. The gene that codes for sickle cell disease also protects the individual from malaria, which is a bloodborne pathogenic disease spread through mosquitoes. Something that's really interesting that has been observed with Huntington's disease is that a protein involved in Huntington's is also protective against some types of cancerous tumors. You may wonder why these things haven't been erased through processes like evolution or natural selection and that is because of the beneficial factors they have earlier in life. To understand how this might work in Alzheimer's disease, we must analyze one of AD's genetic risk factors, the apolipoprotein ApoE gene. Every person has a copy of the apolipoprotein gene on chromosome 19. When it comes to the few types of alleles on the ApoE gene, those that combine with epsilon-4 present the greatest risk of developing late-onset Alzheimer's disease. Any combination of epsilon-2 or 3 without a copy of epsilon-4 is phenotype 1. Phenotype 2 contains one copy of the E4 allele. And phenotype 3 contains two copies of the E4 allele. With just one copy, the risk of developing AD is around 35%. With two copies, however, that risk jumps to roughly 70%. So this epsilon-4 allele is kind of the bad copy of the gene, but remember, this is just a genetic risk factor. It doesn't mean an individual will necessarily develop Alzheimer's, just means that they are at more of a risk. So with phenotype 1, there is no genetic risk for developing AD. With phenotype 2, there is a moderate risk and with phenotype 3, there is a high risk of developing the disease. It is important to note that right now, the particular combination of two epsilon-3 alleles seems to be protective against Alzheimer's disease. This is why I find it important to focus on grouping the E3-E4 combination separately from the E4-E4 combination. Right now, the prevalence or likelihood of having these alleles being present in our population are quite high. Having at least one copy of epsilon-4, about 50% of our population has that. 
That means that roughly half of the individuals in our population specific to the U.S. have at least one copy of this bad allele for this gene, which is again roughly 35% risk of developing AD. For the higher risk, that is at about 70% chance, only about 10% of our population has both bad copies. This might sound like a lot of people because it is. Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia out there with more than 6 million people having the disease. And to reiterate, the risk factor doesn't mean you will have it, just that there is more of a chance. We're trying to make a connection between this particular risk factor gene of Alzheimer's disease with some sort of antagonistic pleiotropic effect. Researchers have wondered if the onset of Alzheimer's disease can be detected earlier in life in order to help prevent symptoms and treat them more effectively. Testing the cognitive performance of younger individuals with the second and third phenotypes may be the key to the earlier discovery of the disease. Studies have shown that young epsilon-4 carriers actually have improved attention and broader attention spans, as well as increased brain activity. What is also interesting is that they seem to have more improved memory in terms of verbal recall, both immediately and delayed, while also being able to remember events from their own life much better than individuals who do not have this allele. It also seems that these young epsilon-4 allele carriers are more likely to progress onto higher education, they have higher IQs and can process things faster, they have improved prospective memory and tend to even outperform their peers cognitively in areas like math and verbal fluency. Again, this is interesting because the same gene is associated with a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease, which causes deficits in these same areas. However, there is a problem in some of the literature in which the meta-analyses are inconclusive. So some studies are showing there is an association in carriers, while some show there is not. This inconclusivity is probably because in research looking at middle-aged individuals, there seems to be no difference when carriers are compared to non-carriers on executive function and memory. One reason that this could be is that now we've discovered that Alzheimer's disease can actually start showing symptoms 20 years before we actually start seeing the classic memory loss issues that first present with the disease. This is why it's important for us to investigate even younger ages of carriers since those who are in the 40 to 50 age range are already probably showing very subtle symptoms of the disease. Essentially, this means that the slope for epsilon-4 carriers starts higher and is steeper. Many prior research articles focus on the presence or absence of the E4 variant in regards to executive functioning and memory and also grouped phenotypes 2 and 3 together, meaning that they're putting one copy of epsilon-4 in the same group as two copies of epsilon-4. This might explain the inclusive literature as one copy versus two copies has significantly different risk rates. This is what my research is trying to do. So again, my research is trying to evaluate the role of the APOE epsilon-4 allele in young adulthood on executive functioning while grouping one copy of the E4 allele separate from two copies of the E4 allele, as well as defining the association between the APOE E4 allele with cognitive advantage in carriers versus non-carriers. The purpose of the study is to separate the existence of one E4 allele from two E4 alleles on executive functioning and memory, which has not been done before. So let's look at the proposed study. For my study, I'm gathering Caucasian females ages 18 to 30 years old. The reason I chose Caucasian females specifically is because this is the population that is most affected by Alzheimer's disease. In order to ensure we have participants that are carriers of the APOE epsilon-4 allele, some participants will be recruited through Alzheimer's disease clinics where they have family members seeking treatments or therapies. For non-allele carriers, individuals be recruited through SONA systems at the university to get a more generalized population sample. There will be no compensation for individuals recruited through the AD clinics. However, those we recruit through SONA, since they are students with the university, they will be allowed to attain credit hours for their courses. 
After doing a priori power analysis with the median effect size of 0.25, we will need around 210 participants. In order to perform the study, we will conduct a battery of tests. First, we'll do the national adult reading test and then follow through with six RVIP tests to measure executive function. We will do an immediate free recall task where we'll present 20 unrelated words, one at a time, every two seconds. And they're going to do a written free recall where they have to recall words by hand. Then we will do some complex span tasks, which will help measure executive functioning. Then at the end of the study, we will do the basic DNA test in order to ensure that we are only testing individuals who completed all of the prior tasks and will not inform participants of their genetic results because some individuals may find these results disturbing and also their ethical implications of not having a medical doctor explain what these results mean to the individuals. So here's how this is gonna work. For our battery tests, we will use a one-way ANOVA. And then for our DNA tests through the Genotech Labs, we will be using an ethanol alcohol-based manual extraction method, which is the gold standard. Basically, individuals are going to spit into a tube and then we're going to provide that back to the lab, which is going to extract the DNA, and we're looking at two SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms associated with Alzheimer's disease. As far as cost goes, it comes out to about $42 for each participant. OG500 is going to be the tube DNA test itself, which comes out to about $20 per unit. And then we'll send that back to the lab where they'll perform extraction, which costs about $17 per unit. The SMP typing, which is about $250 per unit. And the shipping will also be around $350 per unit. Since there is no reporting or data costs and we are not compensating the participants in any monetary way, for the 210 participants to do the DNA testing, it would be just over $8,820. The results of this study could increase our understanding of how these genes affect the lifespan of Alzheimer's disease. If an antagonistic pleiotropic effect is observed, further research could facilitate early diagnosis, which in turn could lead to more effective treatment of the disease. For the study, I propose that individuals with the two copies of the E4 allele will have higher scores on battery tests when compared to those who are non-carriers. And there will be a significant difference between individuals with one copy of the APOE4 allele versus two copies, also in those with no copies. I would like to thank you all for listening in on my presentation on antagonistic pleiotropy in Alzheimer's disease. Thank you so much for attending this asynchronous presentation of our social sciences panel. Um, we, I will post links to the evaluation um, on the, I'm sorry, come up here, Elisa. <laughs> I'm taking Elisa's job from her. I will, I'm telling this to the um, folks on Zoom right now. I'm about to post some links for you and um, Elisa is gonna uh, round out our session. Thank you guys. Oh, sorry. Thank you guys for coming to this panel presentation of the Undergraduate Research Conference. Please remember to post your comments and questions to this panel's page on the conference website, athenacommons.muw.edu/urc, and there are also poster presentations on the conference website, which happened earlier today, but are also available to view and comment on during any part of the day. Thank you for coming, and we'd like you to stick around for the next panel, which will feature in-person presentations and will begin shortly.
Remember to fill out the evaluation that is linked on the conference website or from the QR code on the conference program, or that's available in the paper for the room. And Hillary will also be sending out that code in Zoom.